let's start the tape. <clears throat> Looks like we may have some a few casualties from the Super Bowl. Could be coronavirus or Dos Equis virus or Budweiser virus, maybe. Um, okay, um, what day is the? Um, but we'll press on anyway. Uh, what day is the? What day did we? Uh, does it say is the test on the syllabus? Yeah, is it two weeks from today or two weeks from Wednesday? February 19th. How is that possible? February 19th. Oh, that's two weeks from Wednesday, right? Oh, okay. All right. All right. So that means um, that means I've got some work to do. Okay. <laughs> uh, to get uh, to get us prepared for a test. Um, okay. So I want to keep that in mind. Um, all right. So. Um, uh, today we're uh, uh, we're going to do th- this is a, 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 a good topic for a, a, a maybe a, um, a a Monday where we're a little dazed um, because um, uh, we're going to do some problems that uh, uh, probably you uh, already know how to answer uh, but um, um, I'm going to add uh, just a lot of annoying detail uh, to them okay. Uh, uh, to make them really um, annoying, um, so um, uh, just bear with bear with me because there's a, a, a method to uh, why I'm trying to add um, as much detail as I am. So um, when you see a question, in many instances the the answer will seem apparent um, because these are these are going to be basic uh, uh, counting problems, um, and uh, but. Um, again, I'm going to try to break them down uh, in a very painstaking way um, uh, for a reason um, when we get to them. Um, before we do that, though, um, I wanted to just uh, follow up on um, uh, uh, Gridmaster, that game that we were uh, playing last time or talking about last time. It was the last one from the notes, slightly different from the things that you have in your homework problems. Those, uh, those two games in the homework problem, Cunan and um, uh, Poison Cookie. Uh, but um, so for Gridmaster, remember that was played on an 8 by 8 grid, and uh, it's a tiling game. Uh, and uh, each player is uh, taking turns, right, placing a domino on the grid. And then um, uh, um, the first person who cannot uh, put the domino uh, on the grid um, is the loser. And we were wondering if there was a winning strategy uh, for that, okay? And I never explained that I think there is a winning strategy for that. Did anyone come up with a strategy they thought were, was guaranteed to win? No. <laughs> if you tried to play it again. Um, it's a little bit hard to play on an 8 by 8 grid because um, it, it takes a while to finish the game. So, you ha- so uh, uh, you know, to, usually to devise a winning strategy for a game, you need to you know, play it a few times, right, uh, 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 to understand that nature of the game. Um, so I'll show you what I think is the winning strategy, but I, I will leave it to you guys, maybe on the next homework, or maybe this will be a good sample test question uh, to, to actually demonstrate that this is a, uh, to actually prove that this is really a winning strategy. See if you can come up with a convincing argument for uh, why we have a winning strategy. And I think it's a winning strategy for player two, all right, so, but let me see if we can describe this. So, um, I think you've already seen an instance, well, you will in your homework, right, where uh, where player two, um, uh, uh, you've already seen an instance where player one had a winning strategy. I think that was the first game that we played last time, uh, and uh, overboard, and then, uh, was that player one? I think player one had the winning strategy for overboard, and I think, but I think here, player two has a, uh, uh, it's player two that has a winning strategy. Um, so, uh, I want someone to play Gridmaster with me, but you'll have to be player one. So, uh, but we're not going to go all the way through the game, okay? But I just want to show you what player two's strategy is and have you think about why that um, should be a winning strategy. Okay, Kayla seems very eager to. All right, okay. <laughs> okay, Kaylee wants to be Gridmaster. You want to you go with blue or green? Uh, green. Green, okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, player one is green here. Um, <clears throat> by the way, traditionally player one is white, right, uh, in the homework problems, but uh, just like in chess. But um, but I, white marker is not going to do us much good. So um, so Kayla's going to play green. Uh, all right. So 
that's right. Yeah, right. So you're going to put a domino. So just color in uh, uh, two, right? Okay. All right. So uh, there's where Kaylee has played. Now, here's how I'm going to play. Let's see if we can. Uh, let's see if we can. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show you how to do this, but <laughs> then we'll see if we can. <laughs> we'll see if we can speed it up a bit, or maybe you can think of a way of speeding up a bit. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rotate the board 180 degrees. Okay. So there's a 90 degree rotation, right? Okay. And there is a 180 degree rotation. Okay. Right there. That is what I'm going to play okay but on the original board so I'm going to play the top uh, left hand um, squares on the original board okay all right yeah so I'm going to turn it back around I think that was these two right is that what it looked like okay yeah all right so there's what I will play okay all right so um, so you play there and then see again I'm going to do that right so here and here so I need to think about where that was right so that was in the third column right down starting in the third uh, row okay right huh yeah. yeah right okay so uh, third column starting so these all right so y'all can y'all can probably now with a few moves you can start visualizing how this is going to work okay um, without actually doing it all right but um, all right so just play again, right? Okay, so there and here. Is that right? Here and here. So that was um, sixth row. Is that right? And fourth column. And then across. Sixth row. Is that the sixth row? And four, like this. Yeah, okay. So that is the that is player two's strategy, okay? All right. And so I claim now, but but y'all may prove me wrong, but I think this is the case. I claim that player two is going to win here, okay? Right. So uh, and actually, I think the way to prove this is to uh, uh, just convince yourself. That player two will always have a move. Player two will always have a move. So if player two always has a move, then player two has to win, right? Okay? Because player one then will run out of moves before player two does it. Player two always has a move. So convince yourself that no matter what player one does, player two will have that corresponding move, okay? Meaning that player two has to win, all right? Because uh, player one's going to run out of possibilities before. Uh, player two does. You want to take that and see? Okay, all right. Um, and um, finish the game there and um, see if indeed player two wins. All right, okay. Um, all right, so I claim, y'all can think about it, that that's um, a player two winning strategy for um, Gridmaster. You might find a different one, okay, um, uh, for, that per, uh, for that particular game, all right? All right, so you can add that to your, um, you can add that to your notes. All right, okay. Um, all right, so there are there any questions while we're thinking about it here? Are there any questions about the um, the second homeworks? So I do need to make out the answer key for the first homework. I can I, uh, thinking about the problems uh, uh, after class on Wednesday. Many uh, y'all were right in many instances, and I was wrong. So. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, so I need to go back and uh, fix my uh, <laughs> fix my answers right and uh, show those to you. Okay, um, the uh, uh, the right answers. But do you have any uh, questions on two so far? So we haven't set a due date for two. Maybe um, maybe next week would be a good time to uh, have two uh, due uh, uh, the week before the test at least. Okay, so we have chance to. Uh, post the answers on that. I think I think homework two is maybe a little bit easier than homework one except for the um, those two game problems. Okay. The last one's particularly hard. Uh, but um, the the game Cunan, I think you can if you think about it carefully, you can devise a winning strategy for Cunan. I think hmm uh, seems like player two, but maybe I'm wrong. 
has a winning strategy for Cunan. The, uh, sometimes the way to think about games, if they're not too um, uh, uh, complex, uh, well, if they're not too lengthy, I should say, um, uh, 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 it, it, you know, if it doesn't take too many moves to, uh, to finish a game, uh, 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 some way to think about uh, devising a winning strategy is playing from the final move backwards. So think about what would be the end of the game, right? Okay, and who would, you know, what would be the situation at the end of the game if player one was to win or if player two was to win, and then try to work backwards from that. And um, so sort of reverse engineer the winning strategy, right? And think about if you can, uh, you know, figure out uh, uh, how would you get to a situation at the end of the game so that player one or player two is guaranteed to win, right? Okay. Uh, you can do that pretty easily with Cunan. Poison cookie, however, is a different issue, all right, altogether. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. <clears throat> Okay, so again, let's start getting into some of the nitty-gritty details of counting, right? So we're going to consider much easier problems uh, than some of these problems we've considered up to now. But again, we're going to consider them in a very careful way, all right, uh, so that we can generalize some techniques for counting sets that we can apply in lots of different situations uh, that will make uh, a, 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 some sorts of combinatorial problems a little bit more rote than uh, just... Um, you know, you know, relying on our intuition, right, uh, like we have sort of done so far. Um, all right, so, um, okay, uh, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, so this is described in the notes there. Uh, 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 <clears throat> of course, always, right, uh, when we're counting a finite set, uh, 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 that means setting up a one-to-one -one correspondence between that set and uh, uh, an integer um, um, segment, right, okay? But usually that's not possible, so it's not able, we're not able to do this in the first grade manner, right? Just say, okay, that's item one, that's item two, that's item three, uh, and then, you know, just sort of, we're just not able to count off uh, uh, the elements of the set because the set is either too large or it's uh, uh, too uh, complex for some reason. So we have to rely on uh, indirect methods, all right? So we're going to use two indirect methods, but they're really interchangeable. So uh, we will use them in uh, uh, different situations, okay? Um, so one method is related to just elementary set theory. So if you just know some ideas from elementary set theory, uh, you can use these methods, okay? And then uh, one method is related to um, uh, 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 sort of our knowledge of uh, how algorithms uh, work, okay? Step-by-step uh, -step, uh, uh, algorithms, right? Um, okay. Um, and again, uh, uh, the methods are uh, frequently, I won't say always, but uh, uh, frequently... Um, interchangeable, okay? Um, so we'll rely on them differently, uh, just, you know, at different times, just whatever occurs to us is kind of the, you know, the first thing we think of, the uh, first method we think of that gives us a solution. But we're going to start talking about the, the set theory way of counting sets. All right, now, uh, again, uh, uh, this set theory method is indirect, right? Because um, we have some set that we want to count Set, let's just call it set A, right? So this set is described to you in some way, right? It's got to be described, by the way, in a well-defined fashion. Uh, a well-defined set is a set. I should have put this in the definitions. So who won there, Kaylee? Player two. Player two did win? Okay, all right. So, um, um, which proves nothing, right? It's just in uh, <laughs> that particular situation. Uh, player two, one, right, okay? But that might have depended on what your first move was or what your sequence of moves, right, was for player one. But a winning strategy would be no matter how player one played, player two is guaranteed to win, right? Also, uh, when we did it last time, we did two games and player two won both times. Oh, okay, all right. Not with any strategy, <clears throat> just... Oh, you think, oh, I see, so you think that game is sort of a trivial game. Uh, player two wins, uh, any strategy is a winning strategy. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> I bet you can think of a way for player one to win, though. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think you can uh, uh, just let player two really uh, screw up, and you, you find that player one can win, right? I think. Okay. Um, all right. Um, all right. So I forgot my uh, train of thought. Right. So, um, uh, by the way, the set that we're counting has to be well-defined. This is a tricky, and so I should have put this definition in, and, and demonstrated this, but uh, a, a well-defined set is one where it's it's clear what elements are in the set and what elements are not in the set. Okay, and it is possible to create sets that are uh, 
to describe a set, you think you're describing it in a perfectly reasonable way, but it turns out it's not well defined. It turns out some elements can be in the set and out of the set at the same time. You cannot have that situation with a set, right? It's got to be uh, uh, understandable. Something is in the set, it's not in the set, and there's no uh, ambiguity about what's in the set and what's not in the set, okay? All right, but if we, even if we have a well-defined finite set, again, uh, uh, because it may be uh, large enough or complex enough uh, that we can't just uh, uh, count it by, uh, uh, you know, just uh, uh, listing off the elements. So we have to do this indirectly. What we do, and so I think we've already discussed this, is we'll create a model set, okay, uh, 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 that uh, 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 that somehow represents set A, all right? But we want our model set to be a set that we can count easily, okay, all right? And if if B is really a model for A, then, you know, whatever the size of whatever the cardinality of B is, that will also be the cardinality of A, okay? Now, uh, uh, that means, uh, that brings up the question of what do I mean by a model? Well, uh, if a set B is going to model the set A, that means that um, there has to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of A and the elements of B. So you have to have some natural way of uh, mapping uh, all the elements of A onto an element of B, and vice versa, okay? And it's got to be in a one-to-one -one manner, all right? So every element of A has to be uniquely associated with an element of B and vice versa, all right? Actually, um, in the long run, <laughs> for all of the, in the long run, for all of these finite sets, what we're doing is we're trying to uh, 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 create an integer segment model for our set, right? Okay. Uh, remember, to count a set means you have to set up a one-to-one -one correspondence between your set and an integer, integer segment. So actually, all counting problems are modeling problems, all right? Uh, but we want to model sets when we count them with an integer segment, okay? But uh, uh, we can't always do that directly. Sometimes we have to do it uh, via a second set, okay, uh, that we understand better than the original set. Um, all right. So until we see this demonstrated, that's that's all kind of very abstract and vague, right? Um, but when you see it demonstrated, uh, it'll be a very easy idea to comprehend, and um, it'll be so easy that it will be kind of annoying because you'll be thinking, I'm I'm adding too much detail to a problem that's not that difficult to solve to begin with, okay? Um, but we have to do that. Uh, all right, now um, there's a second method though, okay, for uh, uh, counting finite sets, okay? And this is based on algorithms, all right? Okay, so uh, let me see what this says. Um, so our second method uh, uh, requires us to have an algorithm, you know, a series of steps, right, uh, that we could program, an algorithm that generates the elements of the set A, okay? All right, so uh, if you come up with an algorithm that you can use, right, to create the elements of the set A that you're trying to count, then often you, you can use your knowledge of algorithms uh, to um, um, uh, count the set A, okay? So you have some set A that's described to you in some way. And again, if you have a step-by-step -step method, an algorithm for actually so, sort of putting together, creating, right, the elements of the set A, then you can sometimes use your knowledge of algorithms, how algorithms work, or you can think of this as computer programs, right, how computer programs work, right, to uh, 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 count uh, the elements of the set A. Because if you know the different number of ways that your algorithm can execute, Right. If you know the different number of ways your algorithm can execute, and remember, what does your algorithm do? It creates elements of A. So if you know the different ways your algorithm can execute, then you'll know how many elements there are in A, right? Okay. Because every different execution of the algorithm will give you a different element of A, right? So if you can somehow count, oh, this is how many ways I can execute this algorithm, then you'll know, oh, this is how many ways I can create elements of A, so I know how many elements in A there are. Now, there are some, unfortunately, there are some uh, little complications to that, right? Um, when, you, uh, when the algorithm is working, you have to make sure that um, the algorithm doesn't go astray, right? Okay. So you have to have an algorithm that you know the output from the algorithm is always going to be an element of A. It's not going to be something outside of A, right? Okay. And you also have to know that um, 
Um, uh, you can't uh, when you execute your algorithm, it can't execute in different ways, but give you the, uh, at, at the end the same output. Okay, so you can't have an algorithm that executes different uh, paths but ends up with the same output. Okay, uh, because then you won't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between how many ways the algorithm executes and how many elements you have in A. Right? Okay, um, so you have to uh, uh, be a little bit careful about. Uh, the algorithm that you're used to create uh, your elements of A. But if you have these conditions met, which is frequently the case, then um, you'll know how many elements of A if you can count the different ways that the algorithm executes. But that turns out to sometimes be pretty easy. Okay, uh, So that makes it easy to count uh, the set A. All right, we're not going to work on the, first uh, the second method first, though. So we'll get to the algorithm method later. But then you're going to say, well, that's really the easier way of counting sets. So why didn't you start with that one? Okay. Well, because I don't always want to start with the easy way, all right, uh, because we have larger goals in mind here, right, uh, sometimes than just answering questions. Um, all right. <clears throat> all right, so let's go back to the set, uh, the elementary set uh, method, okay, and um, I'm going to remind you of some, uh, uh, some really basic ideas from elementary set theory, and, um, and then we'll show you how we can apply them to count sets. It's pretty obvious, I think. All right, so um, suppose we have a set. Um, I think we're assuming, well, I don't think we have to assume that uh, uh, always that in these theorems our sets are finite sets, but, um, uh, but, but we're always going to be working with finite sets almost always, so we can go ahead and assume that. All right, so suppose you have S as a set and it's a finite set. Now, a partition of S is a collection of subsets of the original set S, okay? So that's a collection of subsets. Here I've uh, said they're M of these subsets, okay, um, <clears throat> such that every element in the original set S is contained in exactly one of the subsets. That's called a partition, all right? And each of those smaller subsets that makes up the bigger set S, that's called a part of the partition, duh, okay? So that makes a, a, a perfectly good uh, sense in, in terms of terminology, all right? So again, you have a set S, right, okay? And you have it subdivided into subsets, all right? Uh, uh, but in a particular way, uh, it must be that uh, each element of your original set is in one of the subsets only, only one of the subsets, okay? All right, so um, here's our first uh, very simple counting notion, all right? Um, the cardinality of the original set is the sum of the cardinalities of the smaller sets. That makes perfectly good sense, right? Okay. Um, if you want to count the set S, correct, um, you just add up the sizes of each of the subsets, correct? Okay. That intuitively makes sense that that's true. We're not going to prove this theorem, but that intuitively seems uh, valid, correct, because every one of your uh, elements of S, right, is in one of these subsets, correct, okay? So if you add up the cardinalities or the sizes of each of the smaller subsets, that's going to give you the size of the original set, correct, okay? So uh, that theorem is almost uh, uh, just self-evidently uh, true, okay? Uh, we can't prove it but uh, uh, formally, but... Um, um, I don't think anyone will argue with it as a, a, a valid. Yeah. So, does that mean that it would be n? No, because these can be larger than 1. Yeah. So, if these were a, 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 a singletons, a singleton is a one element set, right? So, if these were all singletons, then the size of S would be exactly m, right? So, you're saying that uh, each element of S is in exactly one of the subsets? Yeah. Right. Yes, right. As long as every element of S is in one and only one set. But these sets can have multiple elements of S in them. But you can't have the same element of S here and here simultaneously. Okay. All right. Um, so again, that sort of uh, uh, breaking that up into uh, uh, distinct parts, that's called a partition. Uh, of the original, uh, that's called the partition of the original set. Um, the partitions can be empty, okay? So the partitions could be empty. So one, uh, uh, a trivial partition of a set would be all of the partitions empty except the last uh, partition would be the same as the original set, okay? 
So that's kind of a meaningless partition, right? But that would work, okay? So see that means that con uh, that uh, conforms to the theorem, right? If this uh, partition is the whole set, then all of these are going to have cardinality what? Zero, right? So you're adding a bunch of zeros, and then you're just saying this cardinality is the same as this one, but that's the whole set, right? Okay, so that's just uh, uh, kind of a nonsense partition, but it does meet the conditions of the does meet the conditions of the theorem. All right, now that's a very basic theorem, but it has really important uh, uh, consequences to it. Okay, right. So it's very elementary, right? It's uh, a theorem that uh, is really, uh, uh, you know, an elementary school student could apply. Okay, and probably does apply all the time without thinking about it. All right, but it does have important uh, consequences. Okay, so actually, some really foundational theorems in uh, 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 mathematics are kind of uh, 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 specific cases of this theorem. All right, you'll recognize them when you. We're going to get to them uh, when you see them. All right, now, um, so um, uh, partitioning a set into subsets, that's often a way we can create a model for a set when we're trying to count it, okay? Why would that be the case? Because these partitions might be easier to count, you see, because they're smaller sets, right? So they may be easier to count than the original big set, all right? Okay? All right, um, let me show you now. But let me show you now another another model or another way of creating a model. And again, you're very familiar with this, so this is not going to be shocking to you, okay? Right? Uh, in any way. Uh, but uh, this is extremely useful uh, 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 model. In fact, in a way, I think virtually every model that we're going to create really stems from this theorem. From this fact, okay. Almost all the models are based on this theorem. Um, okay, so uh, so we have to have a definition first, though. You know what a cross product of sets is, right? Okay. So if you have a collection of sets, so these can be uh, completely distinct sets. These don't have to be subsets of a larger set. So you just have this collection of sets. Okay. So this can be a set of dogs. This can be a set of cats. This can be a set of numbers. Right, they can be uh, uh, totally unrelated uh, to each other. Um, uh, for this definition, although it's not really required for our purposes, we do want the sets to be each of the sets to be non-empty. If you have an empty set thrown in there, it kind of uh, screws everything up for our purposes. Okay, but in the general definition, the sets do not have to be uh, non-empty. All right. So, um, uh, okay. So suppose you've got this collection of sets. Now you're going to form an M tuple. An M tuple. So you know what an M tuple is, right? Okay, it's like an ordered pair from uh, 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 elementary algebra, or it's like an uh, ordered triple from calculus three for those people who are uh, have had calculus three, right? Okay, it's just an ordered uh, list of uh, numbers. So if there's two of them, we call that an ordered pair. If there's three of them, we call that an ordered triple. But you can have more coordinates than just uh, uh, two or three, okay? All right, so if you form the set of all of these M tuples, if you form the set of all of these M tuples, that's called the cross product of the original set. Um, now, uh, uh, but we do have this one condition. Um, the first coordinate must come from the first set, right? The second coordinate must come from the second set, all right? The, the uh, third coordinate must come from the third set uh, down to the last coordinate must come from the last set, okay? So when you do that, when you form that uh, collection of these tuples for any collection of sets, that's called the cross product of the sets. You're familiar, of course, with uh, a very famous cross product. You're familiar with this cross product the reals uh, 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 cross itself, all right? That cross products, you know that better is what? What now? 
yeah, that's the Cartesian plane, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. Because in the Cartesian plane, right, we represent um, uh, points in the Cartesian plane, right, with ordered pairs, correct? Okay, so uh, that's the cross product that uh, you use, uh, you know, far more frequently than any other uh, cross product uh, up until now. But we're going to use cross products all the time, okay? So uh, they're <laughs> virtually every day. Uh, we'll use, if not every day, we'll use cross products uh, to help us uh, uh, account sets, okay? <clears throat> and we won't be limited to just two factors in the cross product, okay? Uh, our cross products will often in involve multiple sets, okay? Um, all right. <clears throat> so, um, you know how I, I didn't, I already uh, used the notation, uh, right? Uh, oh, we denote cross product by what? I forgot. To write it down here. So, what do we use to denote cross product? X. Yeah, the x, right? So, just like with uh, a multiplication here, all right? So, that's the notation that we use to uh, denote a cross product. And then here's the theorem that tells us how many uh, elements are in a cross product, okay? And um, I think this theorem is actually a consequence of theorem one. Okay, so I believe, but we're not going to use, uh, we're not going to prove theorem two, but we can use theorem one actually to prove theorem two. Okay, so I think theorem one actually comes from, uh, 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 or relies on uh, theorem one. All right, uh, but but um, that notwithstanding, okay, um, there's the really useful fact. All right, so if you want to count the elements of the cardinality of a cross product, okay, you just take the product of the cardinalities, okay? When you take the cardinality, that should be a scalar, right? So That's right, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> I'm not taking the cross product of scalars, right? Okay. So here you have. Let's take the let's take the vertical bars off for a moment, right? So what is that thing? That thing is a what? Uh, a, a, what sort of creature is that, Kaylee? Yeah, it's a cross product, and a cross product is a a set, right? Okay. Cross products are sets, so it's a collection of things. What sort of things go into a cross product? Begins with a T <laughs> and a U. <laughs> Tuples, right? Yeah. Tuples go into uh, cross product. Okay. Tuple is our uh, uh, fancy word for pair when or triple when we have too many uh, uh, coordinates, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. So tuples go into a cross product set, but this is a set. Okay. Right. But when I put the uh, 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 the absolute value bars on it, what what does that mean? That's the cardinality. So that is a what? What sort of thing is that? That's no longer a set. That's just a, that's a number, right? Okay. That's just a number. Yeah. Uh, now, well, okay. <laughs> when I say it's just a number, it's just going to be a number uh, 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 as long as these sets are all finite, all right? Um, when, you, when you're dealing with R cross R, the real numbers cross the real numbers, you can create the cross product, right, okay? But it's not a cross product of uh, finite sets, okay? So it gets a little bit dicey when you want to start talking about its cardinality, okay? All right? But we have, we're not talking about the cardinality of infinite sets. We're only talking about the cardinality of finite sets, yeah. Yeah, so what's below is just the product of the cardinalities, right? Okay, so these are just numbers as well, right? So you just have this number is equal to this number, okay? Yeah, and these are both finite numbers because we're only working with finite sets, okay? Now, if we've thrown, unfortunately, if we've thrown, a, 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 you know, a curveball in here and one of these is empty, then its cardinality is going to be zero, and uh, that makes all of this zero, right? Okay, so I want to avoid uh, that situation. All right. Um, okay. Um, all right. So um, both theorem one or theorem two, just what it says here in the notes here, and they have lots of useful corollaries, special cases of these two theorems, which are very famous and again very elementary. 
a, a theorem. So there are things that you may have encountered as far back as, I don't know, middle school, grade school, okay? Uh, you may have uh, uh, used these ideas, okay? So they're, uh, they're uh, uh, elementary, but that doesn't mean they're not powerful, all right? They're very uh, important. So uh, here's the first one. Okay, um, this theorem is called inclusion-exclusion, uh, but this is version one of uh, uh, inclusion-exclusion. So we're going to have actually three versions of inclusion-exclusion, and this is version one. And in this version, the exclusion is kind of missing. So, so you may, so it's a little bit of a question: is where does the term exclude? Uh, how does the word exclusion come in here? Um, into this theorem, okay? Well, it doesn't really show up until version two of the theorem. All right, so so you know this theorem, right? Okay. Um, if you want to count the union of two sets, right? Okay. As long as they're disjoint, disjoint sets, right? Disjoint means they do not overlap. They do not overlap, so they're completely independent. Okay. Then um, that's easy to do, right? You just do what? That's right. You just add up the cardinalities, right? So that looks a lot like theorem one, correct? Okay. Uh, that looks a lot like theorem one. And this indeed is a corollary, a consequence of theorem one. Okay. Um, so uh, this is directly related to theorem one. So what does theorem one say? A again, theorem one says what? If you have a, a big set, right, and it is partitioned into, yeah, disjoint subsets, okay, so if it's partitioned into uh, disjoint subsets, then you know what the uh, cardinality of the uh, a large set is, right? It's the sum of the cardinalities of the subsets, okay? All right, that's theorem one. So, uh, and this is its most basic, well, I don't know if it's most basic, but this is one of its easy uh, consequences, right, is this theorem called inclusion-exclusion, all right? So uh, the, uh, the cardinality of a union of two sets, the combination of two sets, right, is just the sum of the cardinalities provided but the sets have to be what? The sets have to be disjoint, right? The sets have to be disjoint. Okay, so that's really important. Remember, the sets have to be disjoint. All right. So I claim now, again, this is a direct consequence of theorem one. Can y'all prove that? Can y'all write down a proof of that? Okay, I'm going to ask you to do that right now. Okay, so see if you can write down a uh, just a few lines there uh, uh, about why this theorem is Correct, okay, and it's related to theorem one. What do y'all want to see, this or theorem, you want to put theorem one back up? Okay, so I think maybe three sentences is um, maybe all that's um, required there. All right, so y'all see this uh, uh, this famous theorem, right? Y'all know this theorem. So there's, um, there's theorem one. So why is theorem three um, directly related to theorem one, okay? See if you can just give an explanation for uh, that. to think what I would say.
Okay, so how can I explain this now? Ooh, quickly, I don't have much room there. I didn't leave my... Oh, did I leave... I did, down here. All right, so how can we... Um, how can we use Theorem 1 to prove Theorem 3? What should we say first about why uh, 3 results from 1? Remember, you have to refer back to Theorem 1, right? So what should you say to sort of link yourself back to Theorem 1? Yeah. Okay, so... Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. So you said A union B is a set, right? Okay, so uh, uh, let's uh, uh, let uh, S, is that a, kind of a way of saying that symbolically, right? Okay, so there we have this set, which is, a un, which is the union of A and B, right? Okay, all right, so now what? Mm -hmm. Ah, perfect, right. Since A and uh, uh, B are disjoint, Um, they uh, form a partition of S, right? So wait, uh, so I we don't have to write this down, but uh, let, let's at least say it. So um, they form a partition of S because what makes something a partition of S? Every element of S, what? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Every element of S, right? is in either A or B, but not both, correct? Okay, yeah, all right. So every element of S is in uh, uh, one of these two sets, right? Exactly one of these two sets. That's because they are disjoint, right? Okay, and they its union is this set S, right? Okay, all right, so, um, so you're right. Uh, uh, they form a partition, and now... Uh, that's right, yeah, okay. So uh, uh, by uh, uh, theorem 1, right? So now you can directly quote here uh, theorem 1. So we have S, right, would be equal to this, correct? Because this is what S is, right, by definition. And then this is going to be what? Um, A plus B? Perfect, right. Yeah, okay. So um, there you have it, okay. Uh, this very famous theorem, uh, if you have uh, 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 two sets, right, and they're, they don't overlap, and you take their union, then, um, uh, 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 then the cardinality of the union, right, is just uh, the sum of the uh, cardinalities. Okay, now, this only applies to uh, two sets, all right, okay, but, of course, in that theorem one, right, uh, 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 you really, uh, I mean, that theorem one, uh, our partition can have any number of sets. So really, you can extend this theorem, right, to uh, the union of any number of disjoint sets, right? Okay, not just uh, a two. All right, so here's another uh, a, a definition that you're familiar with, right? And it's going to lead to a counting theorem again, that's uh, very easily uh, 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 to prove, right, okay? So um, uh, 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 suppose you have a, 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 a set A, and it's a subset of another set. Uh, it has to be a subset uh, uh, of another set, which we're going to call U, all right, uh, in, this, um, in this definition. Usually, the, the reason we call it U is uh, uh, sometimes U is referred to as the universal set because it contains uh, the set A, all right? Um, then you then uh, once you've got a set and a universal set, you can form what's called the complement of the set A. Okay, but you have to have the universal set first to form a complement. All right, so uh, um, uh, so you have a set A, and then set A is contained in some well-defined set uh, U. Uh, well-defined. So uh, you cannot say, oh, I've got a set. Um, S, no, I've got a set A, and, um, well, let's just let the universal set be um, the set of all things, okay? Um, that is not a well-defined set, okay? The set of all things is not a well-defined set, all right? Um, you see what's wrong with the definition of the set of all things? Why that set wouldn't be well-defined? What? Can 
Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I'm, I'm I'm saying here when uh, what I'm, the point I'm trying to get across here is when you're dealing with a set and you want to form its complement, you must have a uh, a universal set. You must have a set in which the uh, the set you're starting with is contained. All right. It's got to be a subset of the universal set. But the universal set has to be well defined. Uh, it's got to be a well defined set. Uh, that means you have to understand what's in the universal set and what is not in the universal set. So sometimes people get lazy and say uh, they, they want to form a complement of a set, uh, but they don't have a universal set defined. So uh, they think, okay, I'll just let the universal set be everything. Just let it be the set of all things. A is certainly a subset of the set of all things, right? Okay, but the set of all things is not a well-defined set. That's not a well-defined set. What what could be wrong with the definition of the set of all things. Well, the problem is the word thing, right? Okay, yeah, that's a very vague term, right? Okay, of course, we use it all the time in English and we understand each other uh, very well, right? Okay, uh, that's because we're always communicating in context. But in a mathematical context, the word thing is not, uh, uh, not uh, uh, precise enough, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so if you're working with, uh, if A is a set of numbers, right, then you might uh, uh, be able to uh, better define your universal set, correct, okay, uh, 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 as some larger set of numbers. Better be careful also saying the set of all numbers because, I, Edward, you, you, Edward, you have to understand what all numbers are, okay. And numbers is also a, 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 a can be a slippery term as well. Okay, believe me, mathematicians struggled a long time with what to call a number and what not to call a number. All right. Um, um, okay. Uh, it, it, that conversation may be ongoing actually. Um, all right. So um, all right. So so you have to have a, a well-defined universal set. That was just the uh, the the point of all of that. And. And in most instances, a, a universal set will be easy uh, to lay your hands on. All right. So the complement of A, which we usually denote by A bar, but there are other ways of denoting complement. So this is not standard notation all the time. Um, the complement of the set A, okay, which you can also write as U minus A if you want to write it down kind of algebraically, or, or sometimes uh, you read this U less A, okay. Uh, also, those are all, all, different uh, all different notations for complement. Then uh, what that means is everything that's in U that's not in A. Okay, So it's just sort of uh, uh, take the universal set, subtract A from it, and what's left over is the complement of A. Okay, right. But uh, this definition doesn't work unless you have a universal set, right? Okay, So, um, so that must exist. So be careful of that. Okay, uh, you're going to want to form complement sometimes, and uh, if you do that, um, not sometimes. You want to form them all the time because they're very useful. But make sure when you do that, you understand what the universal set is. Okay, and then here is the um, here's the important theorem. Um, here's the useful important theorem here. Um, here's how you uh, count a complement. All right, it's just. Uh, 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 the cardinality of a complement is just the cardinality of the universal set minus the cardinality of A. Okay, that makes perfect sense, right? Everything in U that is not in A is how you form the complement, right? So the cardinality of the complement is everything in U, right? Take away the things that are in A, right? So you get a perfectly, you know, obvious uh, uh, counting uh, uh, result there, right? Okay. Um, can y'all prove that? Now, so this doesn't just uh, 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 this theorem doesn't just uh, pop up independently. This is a consequence of theorem three, the one you just proved about uh, uh, the inclusion exclusion version one, the one you just proved about unions. So how can you easily write down a proof of theorem four based on theorem three? Okay, can y'all write that down in just two or three lines? All right. So try writing something there. And again, our, our, remember, our goal is to apply these theorems, right? Okay, <laughs> but uh, just along the way here, it's because they're easy. Let's see if we can write down proofs. Our goal is not really to prove these theorems. That's really a set. Uh, that's really something that would be a goal in a set theory class, All right? But they're so easy to write down. God, I forgot what theorem five was. I feel 
like sneaking a peek ahead. What could that possibly be? So remember, theorem three is about the union of two sets, right? The size of the union of two sets. Uh, and um, and um, here you have some sets, right? So uh, can you somehow derive this statement from um, theorem three? Must be pretty, huh? Yeah. Must involve a little bit, just a little bit of arithmetic, right? I think, right? Okay, yeah, it's almost self evident, right? I love to prove things that are self evident. It's good practice in math, but um, it also is a good cautionary uh, 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 exercise, too, because um, uh, professional mathematicians. Um, and they'll all admit this, they're an easy mistake for professional mathematicians to make. We make it all the time, is to believe something is self-evidently true, and it turns out to be false. Okay, And uh, you think, oh, this is self-evident, and so I will just skip past that so I can get to the fun stuff, and it turns out that the self-evident thing was not correct. Okay, That's a common source of errors in uh, mathematics. All right, so if you make that mistake, I mean, get used to it because you'll continue to make it. Yeah. That's why it's so easy to prove something's false, but it's so hard to prove something's true. <laughs> oh, I see. Is that right? So, so easy to prove something's false if it really is false. Oh, you just need a counterexample. Usually. Yeah. Well, yeah, some, yeah, that, but that's sometimes uh, easier uh, said than done, right? Okay. Yeah. Sometimes the counterexamples can be difficult to uh, construct. Okay. For everything, yeah. So that does uh, uh, seem more challenging. Um, I think it, uh, and, and probably in general, you're right. But I think there are specific cases where finding the counterexample is really hard, uh, just for some reason. Common torch is notorious for that. Sometimes hard to find counterexamples. Um, all right. So did y'all write down something there? So why is um, theorem four true? Um, what do you just have to note here? That uh, how is U formed? Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, that's the thing to uh, uh, note there, right? Okay, that the universal set is really A and its complement put together, right? Okay, because of course here you have the set A, right? And then this is defined to be right the set of everything in U that's not in A. So when you put those two together, correct? Okay, of course that's going to give you uh, U, right? Okay, and what do we know about A and A complement? They are disjoint, right? Okay, so you also have to make note of that. All right. Then um, uh, I think by what is it? Theorem three, right? Um, what do we know? Um, you will know the cardinality of U, right? Has to be the cardinality of A union A complement, right? Okay, because. U is a union A complement, right? But by theorem three, since these are disjoint, how do we count their union? You just add up their cardinalities, right? Thus, just do a little bit of um, arithmetic here, right? Okay, oops, this is supposed to be plus, right? And now just do a little bit of uh, arithmetic, right? You have this, right, is equal to this plus this. So I can take this term, right? Is that what? No, this term, right? And subtract it from the left hand side, okay? And so um, the rest of that there is just very simple um, arithmetic. Okay. All right, cool. Um.
So, uh, uh, so here's our last theorem, I think. Now we're actually going to do a little bit of counting. You, we haven't, haven't actually counted any sets, right, so far. Um, so this uh, looks a little bit uh, uh, obscure, uh, uh, this theorem, but it's going to turn out uh, uh, to be useful to us also, um, maybe in a little bit different form, okay, uh, than what it's stated here, all right? Um, Let's see what this says, though. This one is uh, seems very obvious. So suppose you have a set, right, and you've got it partitioned into k parts. So you have a partition. So you've got k subsets, right, that don't overlap, right, and they uh, form the whole set, okay. But suppose that your partitions are uh, of, 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 of such a nature that they all have exactly the same cardinality, okay? So you've got a set partitioned into k parts, right? These non-overlapping subsets, correct? But they, each one of those subsets just happen to have the same size, the same cardinality, okay? Um, then, you, then you can count how many uh, uh, partitions you have. That's what this uh, theorem is saying, okay? Just by taking the cardinality of the original set and dividing it by the cardinality of one of the partitions. Remember, all the partitions have the same size, so you can put any subscript here that you want. It doesn't have to be one. This could be two, three, or whatever, right? Okay, because all those uh, partitions have the same size. So if you take the uh, 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 size of the set, right, and divide it by the uh, size of each one of the uh, partitions, then that will tell you how many partitions you need, right? This is obvious. If I have a 24 element set, right, okay, and I want to break it into partitions all of size 4, then how many partitions do I need? 6, right? That's all that uh, theorem is saying, something like that, okay, right? Just how many partitions do you need if you want to break a set of a particular size into partitions of the same size, okay, all right? So uh, this also is a direct consequence of theorem 1. So we can use theorem 1 to prove this, but I will leave that, uh, uh, we'll leave that as an exercise, okay? Uh, that's pretty easy. Um, all right. All right, now fi finally here, let's try one, okay? All right, so this is going to be just so easy, right, that... Um, you're going to be smiling about the first test, right? Because you're going to think, wow, are all the problems this easy? All right? Yeah, well, maybe. Okay, let's see. Um, so uh, our class, our class um, has in it uh, 12 math majors, uh, two math teaching majors, uh, three computer science majors, right? And um, two data science majors and a philosophy major. Yay! All right, yay for the philosophy major. Okay. Okay. Um, Lonely, one lonely philosophy major. So um, how many students are on the class roll? See how trivial that is, right? Okay. So um, you can do that, right, just easily. Correct? Okay. So you can just write down the answer almost instantly. But, uh, all right, so of course I want you to write down the answer for me, but let's try to put it in... Uh, 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 let's try to break it down into uh, set theoretic terms. So I want you to uh, uh, actually write down a model for the set of students in the class and then apply our theorems, right? I don't know how many of you will you'll need, okay? <laughs> Not that many of those theorems that we wrote, right? Okay, to actually uh, count the size of the set. You see what I'm getting at here? So I'm taking a very uh, easy problem, but I'm just trying to show how to map the, uh, the counting theorems onto this very easy problem. Okay, This is to give you practice when we have much more challenging counting problems and uh, we're trying to, again, uh, build our set models right in such a way that we can apply our theorems uh, to count the set model and therefore count the original set, right? Okay, So... Um, just try doing this really formally. So imagine you were teaching set theory, and um, you know you would really, you don't want to solve this problem in a very rigorous manner. How would you uh, uh, do that? Okay. Just take a, we'll just take a couple of minutes. Right, yeah, okay, so. So.
So I should have added that as a condition. Yeah, we don't have any um, any uh, uh, dual majors here. I think we actually we actually might in the class, but I've discounted that. Okay, so how do we do this easy problem, but do it in a, uh, a, a very careful set theoretic fashion there? What do we want to do? What do we define here? We define a, diff a bunch of different sets, correct? Okay, so, uh, so let's do that there. So uh, I'm assuming the sets are going to correspond to the majors, correct? Right? So um, let's name these uh, uh, sets of different majors, right? So um, what do I want to call the math majors there? Uh, M maybe? All right, so we'll let M there be the set of the math majors, correct, right? And then let's let T uh, be the set of teaching, uh, math teaching majors. And then we'll let C there, I guess, be the set of uh, 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 computer science majors there. And then let's let D be the set of uh, data science majors, right? And then uh, a P be the set of philosophy majors, right? So we're just going to define those, what is it, five? Uh, 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 sets there, right? Okay, and um, and one other important set, the whole, the whole class, right? Okay, oh, we do that. Oh, so just want to use S, our favorite name. All right, so then just let S, right, be the entire class, right, okay? And now, so what, so again, just to be formally uh, rigorous here, oop, did I make a mistake? Edward? What now? Oh, yeah. What now? Let's see, I think. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the empty set, well, it depends on what our goal is here, uh, Eduardo, so that's a good question. What, so what are we going to say next about our sets, all of these sets? Uh, they're disjoint. They're disjoint, right, okay. And the union, the union makes, up a, uh, uh, makes up the entire class, right? So how can you say that all in one, uh, uh, just one phrase, Dalton? They form a partition, right, okay, correct, right. So uh, you see why we define partition now, because we say the, the two things that uh, you just said a lot, right, okay. Uh, they're disjoint, and uh, their union is the entire class, correct, okay. So um, let me see if I can write all this. So M, T, uh, C, D, P, right, uh, form uh, a partition, of um, S. So, uh, so Eduardo, uh, if you want to throw in the empty set, uh, uh, can you throw that into your uh, partition? Yeah, you can. You actually can, right? Yeah, that's right. Because you won't have uh, uh, you won't have uh, you know if, if one of your sets is empty, its elements are not going to be in any of the other sets, right? Because it doesn't have any elements, right? Okay. Yeah. So uh, well, yeah, because we're gonna we're now we're gonna apply what theorem? Theorem one, right? Okay. So theorem one didn't put any restrictions on one of the partitions being empty, but having an empty partition is going to be in most cases. Not useful. All right. Okay. It's yeah. It's yeah. It's just uh, just going to add extra uh, 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 writing into the uh, into the, uh, the proof. Okay. Um, or into the answer of the problem. So, but I want to I want to reserve comments there, and, not, and I don't want to say it's never useful to have an empty partition because probably there are situations where that might be helpful. But I don't think here, uh, and in most cases, it's not right. So MT. Uh, C, D, P, they form a partition of S, right? So what do we know about S? So S is what? Yeah, it's the sum, right, of these things, correct? 
And um, but we know what that is, right? Hmm. Because this is what? What's the cardinality of m? 12, right, and so forth, right? So we have 12 plus, what is it, 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1? How many does that add up to? Better be 20, right, because there are 20 people on the roll, okay? So, so we have 20 people in the class, all right? So see how easy that was, all right? Um, perfect. Um, how many non-computationally intensive majors are in the class? <laughs> right, yeah, okay. Right, okay. So, um, but how do we put that now in uh, 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 formal terms? Ah, so, yeah, so we can do this in a couple of ways, right? Okay, we could use theorem, uh, of course, we could use a uh, 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 theorem, uh, what is it, three, right? We can use theorem three, uh, but we can also use theorem four, okay, uh, to solve this one. Let's see, um, uh, so let, uh, for computational intensive, what do y'all want, uh, what letter for that? A, okay. So um, A, uh, and that's the union of what? Uh, D plus C, right? Yeah, but I'm starting off with the computationally intensive majors, right? Okay. So here's the set of computationally intensive majors, correct? All right. And then, of course, what is this? Yes, that's right. S is going to be the universal set, right? Okay. So these are the non-computationally uh, intensive majors, right? Just as a note there, S is the universal set, right? And so let's see, how do we count a complement? What was that? Um, that's U right, minus A, right? Hmm. But this is u minus, what's a? d plus c, right? Because a is the union of d and c, right? And we already counted y uh, u just a moment ago, right? 20, right. So we have 20 minus uh, 3 plus 2, right? So the answer that y'all had already um, computed long ago, right? Okay, 15, right. But there it is in um, set terms. All right, one more problem now, just a little bit more fun, okay? Now we have to pick a team of five uh, to represent the class, okay? And uh, we want to choose a team that includes um, every major, all right? So how many teams are there? So how are we going to model this one? So we're going to uh, pick a subset out of the class, right? It's going to be a subset of five. That's the team. But we want a team that's diverse, so we want to include every major uh, in our team, right, to have a nice uh, representation for the class. So how many teams there uh, would there be? One. 
<laughs> yeah, what are we really, uh, so what's our model going to be here? Yeah, so our model is a cross product, right? Okay, yes, our model in this case is a cross product. All right, so why is it a cross product? Because what's a cross product? Oh, no, no, not all the different combinations. So we got to be careful about our terminology. What's a cross product, though, just in general? It is a what? A set of tuples, right? A set of tuples, right? In this case, uh, 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 I'm going to form a set of five tuples, right? Okay. I'm going to sort of form a set of five tuples. The five tuples will represent, uh, uh, will correspond to a team, all right? The five tuples will correspond to a team, okay? All right, now, in a five tuple, right, you have, uh, that's an ordered uh, a list of five things, okay? That's an ordered list of five things. So you have a first coordinate, second coordinate, third coordinate, fourth coordinate, fifth coordinate. Now, remember, in our case, uh, the, uh, the coordinates are team members, right? Okay, the coordinates of our team members. So, what can we say the first coordinate is? Uh, well, you're letting it be what? The first coordinate always a math major, right? Okay, so he's assuming the first coordinate corresponds to the math major on our team. Second coordinate can correspond to the what? Teaching. Teaching. Third coordinate can correspond to... Computer science, data science, data science. yeah, the last coordinate's a little bit boring because that's always going to be the one uh, uh, philosophy major, right? No offense to the philosophy major, right? I'm not saying you're boring, all right? Uh, 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 but the, uh, uh, that set of tuples, the last coordinate is always going to be uh, the philosophy major, right? See, okay, um, how that's going to work, right? So our, what do y'all want to call the set of teams? T, have I used T? Yes. Oh, darn, okay. <laughs> all right, so E, all right, okay, all right, so see, we're going to let E, our model for E be, let's see, M cross T cross um, C cross D cross P, yeah. right, okay, so our model for teams here is a cross product, all right, because in this cross product, right, you have five tuples, right? You have a list of five things. Our first coordinate will be the math major on the team. Our second coordinate will be the uh, uh, teaching major on the team. Our third coordinate will be the uh, computer science major on the team. Fourth coordinate will be the data member on the team. And uh, a fifth member will be the philosophy major, uh, right, from the class on the team, right? Okay. So there's our model for our, uh, uh, our set of teams. But uh, we know how to count this, right? Because what's the size of E? The cardinality of those multiplied together, right? So this is going to be what? 12, right? Times what? Uh, what's that? 2 times 3 times 2 times 1, okay? Ooh, lots of different teams there, right? How many is that? 144. 144, okay, right. So there are 144 distinct teams. Ooh, all right, so I saw that caught you a little bit by surprise, okay? Um, uh, 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 using that cross product now instead of just unions or complements, right, uh, to count uh, uh, this set, okay? Um, but again, see, uh, uh, we we wouldn't have been able to, uh, we, we would have made mistakes, right? There's no way that we could have counted one by one all the possible teams by just by exhaustion trying to figure out all those possibilities, right? Okay. We might have been able to figure it out as a class, but it would have taken us a while, and I bet we would have missed a few, and we would have miscounted, right? Okay. Uh, so we probably would end up with a smaller number than what it really was, which 144, okay? But see here, by creating this intermediate set, Right. OK. By creating this intermediate set and then uh, having a theorem that allowed us to count the intermediate set. Right. That made it easy to count E. OK. But we had to create the intermediate set first um, uh, as this cross product. Well, 
we're gonna, a lot of our intermediate sets are going to be cross products, a lot of them. In fact, in a sense, almost all of them will be some form of cross product, okay? So, uh, well, we need more practice with this, all right? Um, but again, after a few examples, you'll start seeing um, how, to, how to form these models really pretty fast, okay? Um, all right. Um, all right, so we'll continue with examples of this next time. Ah, I'm only one minute over, I'm getting better.